I had a student tell me the other day that he or she does physics in this class, but does history in physics class. Like you should do physics while you're in physics and history while you're in history. I think it would just work better that way. Let's go ahead and open in prayer. If you'll join me, we'll begin in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Take, Lord, and receive all my liberty, my memory, my understanding, and my entire will. All I have and call my own, you have given all to me. To you, Lord, I return it. Everything is yours. Do with it what you will. Give me only your love and your grace. That is enough for me. Amen. In the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. All right, we have three objectives today. By the end of class today, you should be able to do these three things. If by the end of class you cannot do these three things, then I have failed you as a teacher. I'll do my best. Please do your best. Would somebody like to read number five, please? Thank you, James. Yes, we're going to do a little bit of cultural history today um, and talk about kind of the, 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 the 20s are in a way are kind of like our own era. There was some big scientific leaps that came through and people were working through how to process these advances in science with their understanding of the world. Uh, you also had kind of the backlash of World War I that there was, uh, in my opinion, I'm not a historian, I can't make this claim with like academic certainty, but um, it's like there was a backlash from the kind of stuff that would create World War I, and it, the, the backlash, I think, showed up a lot in religion. You see a, a revival of fundamentalism, which is a particular variant of religion we'll talk about. Uh, and I think you get this confrontation between fundamentalism and pluralism, the idea of like, you know, a variety of ideas and, uh, and, and kind of a, and a mix of uh, beliefs. Uh, so yeah, we'll talk, we'll analyze those conversations. Would somebody like to read number six, please? Yeah, thank you. <laughs> yes, uh, Harlem Renaissance is a. We usually think of it as a literary movement. Uh, inspires uh, you know writers. Uh, it's a bigger movement than that. We just probably mostly talk about it in context of English class. So we'll talk about kind of just like artistic flourishing, particularly in the black community that becomes known in the 20s as the Harlem Renaissance, which was, you know, Harlem is a, is a neighborhood in New York, um, but it kind of takes that, that name no matter where the artists are living and working. They call it all part of the Harlem Renaissance. So would somebody like to read number seven, please? Yeah, thank you, Luke. Yes. Uh, it's not because the 20s were louder than any other decade, uh, but that um, it's very much like a youthful decade. And uh, we'll talk about the roaring 20s today. So when you go home tonight and your parents say, what did you learn in school today? You don't have to look at them and say, nothing, like you've been saying since you were eight. Instead, you could say, well, mother, well, father, shall we analyze the major confrontations between fundamentalism and pluralism at this time? And they'll say, why, yes, child, that'll make a thrilling dinnertime conversation. You'll have something to talk about. How exciting will that be, huh? Oh, what a day. You're going to love it. Super exciting indeed. Let's begin in Roman numeral number five. I guess I should get my notes for today. It's going to sound great on the video. Okay. So, um, the 1920s saw a surge in religious fundamentalism. Saw a surge in, in religious fundamentalism. And, and let's make sure we understand the term fundamentalism carefully. It's a specific um, uh, movement in Protestant Christianity that says that, that all like truth can be based... Uh, literally found in scripture. Uh, the Bible is the inerrant word of God, so every detail in the Bible then is literally true. Um, fundamentalism is, uh, it, it comes up every now and then. It's not a huge movement in American Christianity right now, um, but it's a, it's a um, 
periodic thing that comes around from time to time. Uh, fundamentalists basically say that within the bounds of Protestantism, and there, there are Catholics in America, but they're not, it's not mainstream at all. It's a, it's a minority religion uh, in the 20s. Protestantism is definitely the dominant American religion. Um, <clears throat> try to rid Protestantism of any hints of modernity and modernist thought. Now, a lot of evangelical Protestants felt they felt really threatened by the decline of the traditional values uh, that they saw in society, and also the increased visibility of Catholicism and Judaism, which had heretofore not played an important role in American life. But because of the years of immigration, because of the so much immigration, the waves of immigration came through, um, really felt like threatened. Like the, the people were losing. Uh, what it meant to be an American, what it meant to be, uh, you know, American-style Christianity. Uh, fundamentalists were very skeptical of some scientific discoveries and theories, and in particular, focused on the question of evolution. Um, a lot of the press portrayed fundamentalism as like this movement of backwoods, like dummy bigots, um, so like in the popular press, fundamentalism is not super popular, but it's like a movement of people, it, it certainly could be. Uh, first person I want you to meet is Billy Sunday. Billy Sunday up here was a professional baseball player uh, that at some point left the game and went into uh, the preaching business and would hold these big emotional revivals in the South. Revivalism largely doesn't exist in our day. Uh, I mean, there are like revivals, but not as a major movement like it was. But like revivals would be sort of like church services. They would take place over several days, and they were an event. You would go to an event. You'd buy tickets. You'd go to a revival. They usually focused on a main preacher and then like ancillary preachers and a lot of singing and uh, Bible reading. But they, they would be set up in circus tents or in like rodeo stands, wherever you could put in crowds of people. They would have these religious revivals. And Billy Sunday who if you just talked to him, we're just like hanging out, you'd think he'd seem like this sort of low-key, kind of a focused person. Um, but when he started preaching, he would like stand on the deus and shout, and uh, it was a very animated preacher. Billy Sunday, one of the first real breakout revivalist preachers uh, of the 20th century. The next person I want you to meet is Amy Semple McPherson. Amy Semple McPherson, uh, she is in California, so she's not through the American South. She's a California preacher, and she ran a church uh, in Los Angeles that um, she really combined Hollywood-style showmanship um, with radio preaching. She, uh, you know, would pretty easily turn to the airwaves, and she was a she was a compelling preacher that you'd want to go listen to Amy Semple McPherson. Um, and, you know, the, the West, California, particularly in the 20s, not many people are from there. They're mostly, um, you know, like Midwesterners who moved to California for farming or for mining or for whatever reason. Um, and people that were kind of homesick for, uh, for the way it was back home. And she, Amy Semple McPherson, while she is a Hollywood, you know, has a sense of showmanship. She also sounds like people sounded back home and really connected to people who uh, felt like they needed to get connected to. Fundamentalists, uh, besides being preachers, like in addition to their preaching, were also uh, largely in support of prohibition. Um, prohibition, you know, people feel, there were some people who thought prohibition was a violation of individual freedom, and I, I think that's a, a case people could understand. Um, but they said that, you know, basically fundamentalists said that this, uh, it's a freedom that, that is used for vice. Um, and uh, fu fundamentalists ult would eventually force a split in the Democratic Party. In 1925, Tennessee passed a law which would make it a crime to teach evolution. Um, the American Civil Liberties Union, a lawyer's organization that was actually founded during World War I to go reject the Espionage Acts, the, uh, the ACLU was, is a lawyer's organization. Basically, their job was to go sue the government, uh, to go, like, for whatever reason, question uh, somebody's civil liberties. So civil liberties are the protections from the government getting in your business. The ACLU then would sue the government whenever they think that um, there's a case on it. So 
The ACLU um, said they were going to challenge this Tennessee law prohibiting the teaching of evolution uh, and that they wanted to finance a test case. If they could find a Tennessee teacher who was willing to teach evolution and go get him or herself arrested and go challenge in the courts, they wanted to go challenge that case through the Tennessee courts, through the Tennessee Supreme Court, and all the way up to the Supreme Court of the United States and get the law overturned nationwide. And they found John T. Scopes. Uh, John, John Scopes is an interesting character here. Uh, interesting because he is so uninteresting, I think. He um, is not, he's a, he's a high school teacher, but he's not really a teacher. He's a, he's a football coach of uh, Rhea County High School, and he would do some substitute teaching, long-term subbing here and there, um, but he was not like a biology teacher. And I, in a lot of ways, like I think Scopes is kind of a sympathetic character. Uh, when I have to have a substitute come into my classes, I expect that the substitute doesn't know anything about the subject. Sometimes they do, but I try to make it where the substitute come in, put the DVD in the DVD player and go. Or go download the video and take your notes on your own. Like I, I don't expect the substitute to do any teaching. John T. Scopes, substitute, Rhea County High School, was subbing in a biology class. And my guess is that the teacher l does what all teachers do when they can't get there. They say, okay, uh, grab a copy of the textbook, read the chapter, and answer questions in back. The textbook they were using at Rhea County High School was called uh, Civic Biology. A couple years ago, I bought a copy of this book because I wanted to see it. It's a famous book. Civic Biology Presented in Problems. Now, what they did, somebody just scanned the book and turned it into text, and I have never actually read this book. It looks like I would, it looks awful. I've never read a word of it. Um, but I've read about this book enough <laughs> that I have an opinion on what's in here, even though I've never read it, which is bad literature appreciation. But um, the title of it gives you a little clue that it's a civic biology. Like the first word of your science textbook is really about civics. It's about like, it's trying to make science conform to your social expectations. That's a civic biology. Anyway, uh, it sounds like they're trying to pick a fight on science to begin with. That's what they're using at Ray County High School. And uh, the ACLU comes up to Scopes. And actually, if I remember the story right, uh, either his principal or the superintendent was also wanting this law challenged. They come up to Scopes, he's like hanging out in a diner one day, his boss is there, these hotshot lawyers are there and saying, hey, we think we, we think we can get this, this case to overturn and we think you're the man on it. Uh, he's a young single guy, people like him. Uh, he's, he could, they could probably talk him into being a defendant because, um, you know, if, you're, if you have a family, you begin to think of your challenges differently. Like, if I'm going to go to jail, I don't know if I want to, I have a, you know, a children to care for and a house to pay for. Scope seemed like kind of the guy to do it. And his boss is there, and they convince him to go stay in trial in this. I love his line. He says, <laughs> he's going, if you can prove that I've taught evolution, <laughs> and if I can qualify as a defendant, then I'll be willing to stay in trial. This does not sound like some pro-science, screw the man, religion is evil. He's like, if you can prove I've done it, sure. Because he's the, he's the substitute. Like, I don't know. You don't expect a sub to teach anything. Um, but they go to court. And the court uh, goes, the uh, ACLU appoints what is a hotshot attorney at the time, Clarence Darrow, the most famous trial attorney of the day. Clarence Darrow was very famous for like representing the little guy against big bad corporations. Tennessee also needs a hotshot lawyer now, the state of Tennessee, so they, hi they hire a guest prosecutor, our old friend, four-time presidential candidate, William Jennings Bryan. Okay, you getting a phone call or for nine o'clock, you're in school already. Okay, there's a nine o'clock alarm. You wake up. Okay, uh, Claire, so 
You've got Clarence Darrow versus William Jennings Bryan heading off in what is the uh, what is the first real trial of the century? That term would get reused a few times in 20th century, but uh, trial of the century was become known as the Scopes Monkey Trial, as a way of like mocking the idea of evolution. They call this the Scopes Monkey Trial. Uh, William Jennings Bryan, man, uh, this guy, he just keeps hanging around. He's the wizard from Wizard of Oz. He's the cross of gold speech. He's the one of the co-founders of the Populist Party. Uh, Wilson's Secretary of State. He's a pacifist. He resigned the job when we went into World War I. But William James Bryan, man, what a guy. All right. Um, the thing about the Scopes trial is that it was never really about guilt or innocence. Um, Scopes, right from the beginning, is like, yeah, I guess I taught evolution. Like, he just sort of admitted his guilt from the get-go. But it was never really about guilt or innocence. It was about the law itself. The law was on trial, not Scopes. Um, and immediately became a national sensation. 200 newspaper reporters descended on sleepy little Rhea County, Tennessee. Uh, I guess the story was like the person that thought that the case should be in Rhea County, Tennessee was the guy that owned the hotel across the street from the courthouse. And he's like, this could be good for business. And so he like drums up a legal case to go fill his hotel. Um, uh, 200 newspaper reporters came to the United States. It was broadcast on WGN like the biggest, most important radio station in the Midwest, uh, broadcast the trial live. I don't know if you've ever wa like watched a court case. They're incredibly boring. Unless you have some interest in the case, like that's your mother on trial or something. Like They are incredibly boring, but people would tune into it. This was the like, destination uh, radio broadcast. You would tune in anyway. Um, they were in overcrowded courtrooms. Sometimes the courtroom would get so crowded that they had to just like move the trial outside. Uh, they actually built an outdoor amphitheater uh, with a stage up front so that they could go and like have enough people come in attendant. Um, they, uh, but then they move outside and it takes on sort of a circus atmosphere. <laughs> people would bring like trained chimpanzees to go do tricks. They would like juggle and. Uh, you know, to perform and just make a stunt out of it. It's like, ah, oh, yeah, that's your uncle over there, that chimpanzee. Are you involved from that guy? Uh, the, um, the, the latrines, it's the 20s and everybody has indoor plumbing. The latrines have a big sign painted on the front of it that says, read your Bible. Uh, and then sometimes they would pick up that banner and go carry it inside the courthouse as well. If this doesn't sound like what you would expect out of a court case with presumed neutrality, uh, I think that's a fair. I think that's a fair assessment. This is not how jurisprudence usually works. Um, Clarence Darrow, the prosecutor, uh, pulled a pulled an unusual move in the trial. Without getting too deep into the mechanics of the trial, uh, Darrow needed a witness. So, like trials are all about like what's the statement of the witness. They needed a witness to go make a claim about creationism. So they needed to go make a claim that we found in a Bible, which they could thereafter argue. Uh, and for, again, without complicating it, they had a hard time finding a witness that would be acceptable to go stand trial. So Clarence Darrow called the prosecuting attorney. He called William Jennings Bryan to the stand. William Jennings Bryan was a bit of a Bible expert. He's not a fundamentalist, but he, the man had read the Bible several times. He could lecture on it. He was a, William Jennings Bryan could talk about anything. The guy loved being the center of attention and actually was pretty steeped in scripture. And so Clarence Darrow like calls the prosecuting attorney to be a defense witness. Now, again, if you know anything about legal proceedings, this doesn't happen. This is not the way that this should work. But William James Bryan can never not be the center of attention. And he's like, oh, you need a celebrity witness in my own case? Yes, I'm your man. And he goes and he takes the stand as a defense witness in the case he's prosecuting. Um, it's just like pinch hitting on the other team, right? Uh, he's like, all right, I, I think I could go defend this. Um, and so 
Clarence Darrow just totally expects, like, I'm going to befuddle this guy. I'm going to totally run circles around him. He's a clown Christian. Like, there's no way. We, like, this is going to be great. Um, he started asking William Jennings Bryan whether he thought the earth was created in six days. It says in Genesis, the earth was created in six days. Do you think six days? Uh, William Jennings Bryan says, like, there's the, you could read the transcripts. All this stuff is public. You can go read the trial's transcripts. And he's like, well... Yes, six days, but maybe not like a literal 24-hour day. I mean, they didn't make the sun until the third day, so maybe the first day was 25 hours, or maybe it was 25 years, or maybe it's like poetically you read it as an era or an epoch, you know, like an epoch. It's not, like it doesn't literally need to be a 24-hour day. That's not the point. Uh, and everybody in the crowd's like, oh, William James Bryan is not a fundamentalist. He doesn't believe that every word in the Bible is inerrantly true, and you should accept it on its face value. Like, all of a sudden, all the crowd is like, oh, this man defending the state of, the prosecuting attorney of the state of Tennessee doesn't even believe in the thing he's prosecuting for. And, like, the crowd starts, like, oh, my goodness, I can't believe this guy. What an idiot. Everybody's against this. Uh, and if you read the transcript, it's not actually Darrow, who makes Brian seem like an idiot. When James Bryan actually comes across as pretty even-keeled and has pretty good answers to everything, it's Clarence Darrow that seems like he's the jerk trying to, like, needle people and what about him, and he's, like, really the bad guy in the story. But that's not how anybody remembered it at the time or now. Everybody's like, oh, man, all these the Christians are clowns. They don't even believe what they say they believe. And um, John Scopes was found guilty of teaching evolution and um which again was never really in doubt it was never really in doubt um and he was fined uh a hundred dollars which was not nothing in 1925 dollars but it's not a like an unpayable sum you could, a person could come up with a hundred bucks and then um but here's what's crazy uh william james bryan won the case Darrow lost the case. He's the defending attorney, and Scopes was found guilty. But that was actually kind of always the point. Because if you lose the case, then you can appeal the case. If you win, the, if you win, right? But if you lose the case, you can appeal the case. And you can, that's how you get to the state Supreme Court. That's how you get to the federal Supreme Court. It's by losing and advancing. The point was always to lose. So they go and appeal, um, and the next level of the court looks at the case, and they're like, man, everything about this case should be appealed. Like, there's read your Bible banners in the courtroom. There's the prosecuting attorney is serving as a defense witness. Like, that is a terrible court case. Like, everything about it should be appealed. The next level of court says, but we don't want this problem. Drop your appeal. We're not going to take your case. And John T. Scopes was just found guilty. And the case settled as that. They never got a chance to go to the state Supreme Court. They never got a chance to go to the U.S. Supreme Court. The case ended right here. It's like the untold story of the Scopes trial. It also brings to an end our story of William Jennings Bryan. He falls out of the news at this point. He's essentially humiliated. Everybody that ever liked Bryan no longer likes him. He's... Um, <laughs> the, one of like the big things about William Jennings Bryan is he could give these long speeches and he just had a loud voice in an era before microphones just being loud counted. Um, but now there's microphones. Everybody can hear what even quiet people say. And people don't really want to listen to what he says anymore. He sounds like an old man from a different era. And, you know, he's lost his natural base. William Jennings Bryan, uh, shortly after the conclusion of the trial, uh, had a heart attack and died. It's like the last thing we remember of this guy was that he would go and uh, be the bad guy out of the Scopes trial. I think it's a little unfair, but this also brings to a close our discussion of one of my favorite historical Americans that you'd never heard of before a couple of weeks ago. Subpoint D. I know, right? There's, ee, what is this? The 1925 protest of the Ku Klux Klan marching on Washington. The Ku Klux Klan... Uh, what? <laughs> is that the thing? Is it T posing? 
what in the world is that? Like our freshman scholars dwellers took every picture this year with their it's arms up. So. Does it? It isn't like flying like an airplane, like woo, the things you like to do when you were five, running with your arms out, which is fun, by the way. <laughs> Coach Bruning, as you warm up by taking a lap, put your arms out and pretend you're an airplane. It's a lot more fun. Okay. Um, <laughs> So that would be really hilarious. <laughs> Coach Tom gets sick of you. Take a lap. All right. Whee! <laughs> All right. Uh, the Civil War, uh, the Ku Klux Klan became active after the Civil War, but basically the Grant administration had squashed the Ku Klux Klan, uh, and, and they basically went out of business. Uh, by the by the 1870s the Ku Klux Klan was like very briefly showed up and then it kind of disappeared but starting in the middle 19 teens um, the Klan got reborn in Atlanta uh, when um, a Jewish man named Leo Frank was lynched accused of killing a teenage girl uh, and within 10 years by 1924 the Klan had claimed 4.5 million members and had spread out of just like their corner of the south in Atlanta to the north and the west. Uh, the Klan, um, you know, famously opposes black people, but also Catholics, Jews, immigrants, unions. Uh, there's a strong prohibitionist streak in the Klan opposing saloons. Um, and, and, and the Klan was surprisingly politically powerful. Uh, that if a person wanted to go run for office in a number of states, you were expected to have some clan af affiliation. Uh, I shouldn't say you, I shouldn't make it. The person was expected to have some clan affiliation. Uh, the clan, though, was short-lived, and by the mid-1920s had kind of lost its luster. This is, I think this photo is 1925, if I remember correctly, and it's basically the last gasp of the second Ku Klux Klan. Um, and uh, ba the violence and associated came with it. Uh, people it lost its social influence and power. Even if a person has anti-black or anti-Catholic or anti-immigrant or anti-union beliefs, uh, most people aren't comfortable with the violence associated with it. And, and the, the Klan uh, lost its luster and would still exist, but it's kind of a, I don't know, a, a less important organization. That brings us to Roman numeral number six, uh, what an artistic movement we'll call the Harlem Renaissance. Um, race relations, I hope by this point in our story of APUS history, I've got the idea that race relations have been in a constant flux. There, the, has ne the, the story of black and white has not settled well in American history. Um, with limits placed on you know, immigrants from undesirable countries, uh, defended by pseudo-scientific theories like racial evolution, the Klan resurgence, even though it was brief, seems to show that like we have never really settled our relationship uh, with people that don't immediately look like an, a concept of Americans. Um, the uh, having been pushed aside by mainstream white society, African Americans developed a strong black culture, basically rejected by white culture. Black people create a, par a parallel culture, a uh, strong black culture. If black culture is particularly in the 1920s characterized by this like sense of self-consciousness, um, that it's kind of okay to be black and that there can even be pride in being black. Uh, New York's Harlem neighborhood gained an international reputation as like the capital of black America. It was a historically black uh, neighborhood in upper Manhattan. By the 1920s, uh, there was famous movement for people, they call it like slumming, uh, when white people would go into Harlem and go visit the dance halls and the jazz clubs and the speakeasies. Uh, it felt dangerous and edgy for young white people to go into black neighborhoods and hang out in black clubs. Uh, you felt like, uh, you know, progressive and dangerous at the same time. It was like searching for exotic adventure. In the imagination of white p people, Harlem was a place of primitive culture uh, and dangerous and a, and a fun kind of danger. Sub so point B. Um, so Harlem was the world's largest black 
urban area and it made of black people from the United States, but also a lot of uh, Caribbean immigrants w um, lived in Harlem also. Uh, and it became the, the centerpiece of the Harlem Renaissance, uh, an African-American literary and artistic movement, which is really about the pride uh, of being black, that it's, uh, that, there, that there could be something, I don't know, prideful about, like, not prideful, that's, Word means something different here, uh, but it's like that you can that you can be proud uh, of, of your history, uh, and I want to give you a couple of examples of it. Our first person we're going to meet is Claude McKay. Claude McKay uh, is a poet. He's actually a Jamaican immigrant, but he's living in the United States. Uh, he's living in Harlem, and he's one of the great poets of the Harlem Renaissance. I think my favorite poem of his is 1919's "If We Must Die." He writes, "If we must die." Let it not be like hogs, hunted and penned in an inglorious spot, while round us bark the mad and hungry dogs, making their mock at our cursed lot. If we must die, well, let us nobly die, so that our precious blood may not be shed in vain. Then even the monsters we defy shall, not, shall be constrained to honor us, though dead. Though kinsmen, we must meet the common foe. Though far outnumbered, let us show brave, and for their thousand blows, deal one death blow. What though before us lies the open grave? Like men, we'll, fight the mur we'll face the murderous, cowardly pack, pressed to the wall, dying, but fighting back. I like this poem. I like that it gives a sense of direction to the oppression. You know, it says, like, the society hates us. But we're going to fight back, cause people of dignity, people of bravery. Next person we meet was, uh, for a time, a Kansas Cityan. Grew up in Joplin, Missouri. Lived in Kansas City during like the early peak of his career. Um, he's a uh, poet, Langston Hughes. Uh, Langston Hughes is probably the biggest star of the poetic side of the Harlem Renaissance. Um, and my favorite poem of his uh, is The Negro Speaks of Rivers. I, I like this one in particular because I like how uh, I think you, you get a sense of the heartland. I think you get a sense of the Kansas City person that knows about, you know, I mean, the rivers. I think you get it. He writes, I've known rivers. I've known rivers as ancient as the world and older than the flow of human blood in human veins. My soul has grown deep like the rivers. I bathed in the Euphrates when the dawns were young. I built my hut near the Congo, and it lulled me to sleep. I looked upon the Nile and raised pyramids above, but I heard the singing of the Mississippi when Abe Lincoln went down to New Orleans, and I've seen its muddy bosom turn all gold in the sunset. I've known rivers, ancient, dusky rivers. My soul has grown deep. Like the rivers. Langston Hughes, there's a rhythm to his poetry. It's, uh, it's kind of almost like a jazz rhythm to it that it's sometimes staccato and sometimes rolls through. I think he's probably one of the strongest rhythm writers of his era, Langston Hughes. Third person that I want to introduce to you, this uh, is Zora Neale Hurston. Zora Neale Hurston's most important book is not from the 1920s, but the Harlem Renaissance lasted longer than the 1920s. While we're here in this, uh, in this theme, let's go ahead and carry it out. Her most important book is called Their Eyes Are Watching God, which is sometimes a part of the senior year English curriculum. I forget where exactly this will fall. Uh, but so Zora Neale Hurston, she is like this advocate of the poor black people who says that they're, and this is going to sound dumb, but stay with me on this, that like their whole life is an art form, that there is some sense of like skill and honor and glory in being poor and dealing with the crap and succeeding at it or living at it. She, she says it's a kind of folk art to not have anything and yet raise a culture out of it. She writes, it's so easy to be hopeful in the daytime when you can see the things you wish on. But it was night. It stayed night. Night was striding across the nothingness with the whole 
round world in his hands. They sat in company with others in their shanties, their eyes straining against cruel walls and their souls asking if he meant to measure their puny might against his. They seemed to be staring at the dark, but their eyes were watching God. She celebrated what was called the common person's art form, ingenuity and strength earned by surviving hard times. The influence of popularity of the Harnham Renaissance went way beyond black audiences. Uh, they, these are our first like crossover stars. Uh, first thing I want to talk about is a musical comedy called Shuffle Along. Um, it launched the Harlem Renaissance. Shuffle Along was popular with white audiences, with black audiences. It had black performers who would play in white neighborhoods, uh, featuring the talents that had large followings. And Shuffle Along becomes the thing that introduces black culture to the rest of the world. Also on the back of this actor, uh, these great eyes, Paul Robeson. Paul Robeson, uh, the son of a former slave. He became a major dramatic actor. Um, in New York, but also in London. His specialty was that he was a Shakespearean actor and played Shakespeare's greatest role, uh, traditionally written for a black man, called Othello. Um, he, uh, yeah, great Shakespearean actor, became famous for playing Othello in a variety of different shows. Um, yeah, so point D. Let's talk about music for a little bit. Jazz was born in the early 20th century, and it originates first in New Orleans, uh, but it spread across the city, and uh, or spread across the country. It, it, when Joe King Oliver, uh, who's this guy back here in the trumpet, Joe King Oliver led uh, New Orleans jazz band, and uh, he moved to Chicago. When he moved to Chicago, he had the band come up with him, and their sound, would, he doesn't invent jazz, but he's the first one to like spread the sound. Blended ragtime and blues, uh, had complicated rhythm lines for it that was way beyond what other people knew at the time. Uh, New Orleans jazz is still distinct among people that listen to jazz, uh, but Joe King Oliver goes and he introduces it to the rest of the country, uh, moving New, York, er, New Orleans to Chicago and bringing the band with him. Uh, I want to play a clip of little King Oliver here. Um, okay, so if, you, if you're a musician and you hear the term jazz, or if you're not a musician and you hear the term jazz, you might know that jazz means almost nothing. The, like, that term can be used to describe one person in a saxophone to 30 people in a swing orchestra. Like The term jazz actually is very hard to define. Uh, most music historians say that it's really about its rhythm line, that it uses complicated rhythms. It's not just a 4-4 four, four, a 2-4 time. Uh, and the rhythms might even change in the song. Uh, the song we're going to play is Riverside Blues from 1923. This is early recording. There's no drums in the song because drums were hard to record. The tuba takes the rhythm line here. The jazz sound, we would later describe as swing, is the feeling like, I can find the rhythm line in this song, it's pretty clear, but it kind of feels like the musicians are playing just a half a step behind it. There's a feeling that you're dragging the sound along. Jazz musicians call that the swing. It makes you sort of bop your head a little differently. Okay, the next person I want you to meet is Louis Armstrong. Louis Armstrong, uh, probably the most famous jazz musician of his era, I would argue, is one of the greatest of any era. Um, Louis Armstrong was once a member of King Oliver's Creole Jazz Band. Uh, he's a trumpeter, at least in the beginning, he's a trumpeter. Um, and he makes jazz personal. He uh, takes the sound of the New Orleans Jazz Band 
but the, but King Oliver would start giving him solo parts where he would go and you know okay to be a trumpeter you have to have a little bit of swagger you have to be comfortable being the person in the front who everybody's watching. Uh, uh, are there any trumpeters in here? Since yeah, you have to have a little bit of like I can go do this. Uh, some trumpeters, like in mo like a band, a trumpeter is probably the most arrogant person in the orchestra uh, because they just got to jump out there and go do it. An unearned confidence, right? Um, anyway, that's, uh, that's Louis Armstrong. That's Louis Armstrong, although he would certainly earn that confidence. Uh, he would also start practicing improvisation, and this is maybe our second piece of what makes a jazz sound uh, Jazz musicians should not be allowed to improvise until they can do it, which is weird because you can't actually do it until you're good at it, but you're kind of bad at it for a really long time. Um, but uh, Louis Armstrong was great, which means like there'd be the piece and they would all have their music and they'd practiced on, but then there would just be sections that the band would just go let Louis Armstrong just kind of play whatever he was feeling right at the time. And he could improvise pieces of it. Uh, he would later move from... Chicago, New Orleans to Chicago to New York as the stage would get bigger and bigger where he joined Fletcher Henderson's band, the most important jazz band of the city. Louis Armstrong remains the most influential jazz musician in jazz history. This is him on the trumpet out front. Yeah, that's awesome. Still no drum. In this recording, the piano is really take. Piano is a rhythm instrument, but you really get the feeling in here. So here, there's also a sense of swing. It sounds like you can find the beat, but instead of dragging behind. It almost has a, like a tumbling forward feeling to it, like they're playing just a quarter step ahead of the beat. Most modern audiences, if you know Louis Armstrong, you know him after he stopped playing trumpet. He kind of lost his chops after a while. He didn't have the, the lung capacity uh, to keep playing trumpet, so he kind of lost his chops. You probably know him as a singer when he's not really singing, when he's not really doing jazz anymore. He becomes just sort of a pop artist. Uh, you know, the icy trees are green, right? That's Louis Armstrong, and it's not really like what jazz musicians would think of as jazz. What's that? Thank you. Yeah. Louis Armstrong, we're basically the same person. Um, next person I want you to meet is uh, Duke Ellington, Edward Kennedy Duke Ellington, jazz pianist, orchestra leader, and one of, uh, for my money, America's greatest composers. Um, he easily crossed over between a black sound and a white sound. He was a great crossover artist. Everybody liked uh, Duke Ellington. He led a small, um, I mean, not small for the time, I think it was a 12-piece band, um, small compared to how big they would later get. Uh, we call the Kentucky Club Orchestra. Um, he led from the piano. He was a great arranger and musician. Um, and uh, I think, for my money, one of the greatest composers. We're going to play a piece of his East St. Louis Toodaloo, which is one of his lesser known pieces, but I like it. Not as good of recording quality. Again, no drums. Here, is this a saxophone or is this a trumpet with a mute? Trumpet with a mute. They've got a plunger mute on this. Which at the time was like an actual plunger that they took the stick off. Now you can buy a specific plunger mute that's that shape. <laughs> yeah, you can see right on the end there. That's uh makes that wah, wah, wah.
One thing I like a lot about Duke Ellington was even though he's the director of the orchestra, he doesn't insist on being the center. He really lets his other musicians play. And because of that, he could put in some pretty huge personality musicians because he let sort of everybody go be the star for a little bit of time and could put together really an all-star band. Pretty straight up on the beat here. Okay, the next person I want you to meet is Cab Calloway. So Cab Calloway, uh, we know him as a vocalist. I actually don't know if he was an uh, uh, instrumentalist at all, but uh, you know him as a vocalist. And he popularized uh, a style of singing called scat. Now, he doesn't invent it. We actually traditionally uh, attribute scat to Louis Armstrong. But the story goes Louis Armstrong was in a studio session, and he's playing trumpet. No, he's singing. He, is he singing a piece? Anyway, he's, uh, he's singing a piece, and uh, it's part part of the singing. And, but somebody had knocked his sheet music off, and he didn't actually know what the words were in the lines. Of his, but recording time was expensive. Today, recording time is not that expensive, and you can cut and splice in. But in the 20s, that technology didn't exist. So if they're running tape, you roll tape, and you go through all, all the way through. So somebody knocks over his sheet music, and while they're putting it together, the band is still playing, and they're looking for him to sing, and he just starts improvising trumpet sounds. He's like, bop, 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 and bop, bop, and then he just improvises, and people are like, actually, that's kind of cool, <laughs> uh, and it becomes called scat singing. We attribute it to Louis Armstrong. That story might be a little apocryphal. It might have not actually gone down that way. Uh, but the person that was probably the greatest scat singer was Cab Calloway. Uh, and Cab Calloway, I'm going to play a uh, We might not get all the way through today. We're going to try. Uh, Cab Calloway, uh, the, song, the clip I'm going to play is not from the 20s. It's actually from 1980, and it was a clip of a movie which I don't think I can recommend to you because it's rated R. But if I could, I would totally recommend that you watch the Blues Brothers. Anyway, Cab Calloway, his most famous song... Uh, not maybe not famous, my favorite. It's called Minnie the Moocher, 1932. Uh, the recording is from 1980s, The Blues Brothers. Now, this is Cab Calloway as kind of an old man. And he's still a great, but he looks a little haggard because he's an old dude. And he's lived a pretty hard life up to this point. Plunger mute, painted it gold, fancy. Okay, you don't understand some 30 slang. I know you tested on 20 slang on your way in. Let's go ahead and catch you up. Minnie the Moocher means that she's a beggar, okay? She was a low-down hoochie coocher, which means she also is a prostitute, okay? Uh, and, but she's, her heart's as big as a whale, right? Like, she, uh, she deeply loves, even if she's a homeless prostitute. We might call this scat, where he's just making sounds in this case, it's a call and repeat. The audience gets to play. Okay, she messed around with a bloke named Smokey, which means she's hanging out with a drug addict who was kind of cokey, right? They go down to Chinatown and kick the gong around, which means they're going to a heroin den. So you get, you, the slang is totally lost on you. This is what you're going to go home and tell your parents you learned in school today. <laughs> well, mother. Well, father. 
<laughs> Prostitutes and heroin dens. <laughs> Catholic school. <laughs> All right, Cab Calloway, Many the Moocher. I think it's my favorite scene from Blues Brothers, which I could wish I could tell you to watch. I don't think you actually put this part in your notes. I think that's left over from last year. All right, the last person I want to play uh, is a uh, blues singer. So the Harlem Renaissance is not just about the jazz sound, although that's probably the part we remember the most. There's another... Uh, side of it, which is blues, which is related to jazz, but it's not the same. Uh, and uh, the singer Bessie Smith, great blues singer, uh, it's a woman that had some passion in her pipes. Um, Bessie Smith was um, a blues singer, maybe the best vocalist of the decade in any genre. By 1927, she was the highest paid black artist in the world, man or woman, and was enormously popular with major record company support. Uh, the song we're going to play is going to feel very differently than, than Many the Moocher. This was it's supposed to be um, a lot more somber, and her, uh, her piece, St. Louis Blues. You're supposed to feel like this is in Harlem because it's a nightclub with only black people in it. Okay, uh, Roman numeral number seven. In the 1920s, this is the Roaring Twenties, there's economic growth. It's uneven, as we talked about last class, but people do have more money uh, overall for the first time, and they also begin to have the leisure time to enjoy it. Little inventions like a washing machine, which is not a little invention, or a Perco toaster, which is, sounds awesome. Um, these things changed American life. Like, if you don't... I mean, before, washing clothes was literally every single garment had to be hand scrubbed against a washboard. It would take days to go do a load of laundry. Now you throw it in, you walk around, and you go do something else, right? Uh, but it, So th those things changed American life in ways that I'm not sure we can really appreciate. Um, but they've got some leisure time, and they go spend their new money and new time enjoying new 
uh, fun pastimes. Crowds attended sporting events. This is where we begin to see athletes become celebrities because you've got some time and some luxury to go appreciate something like this. In 1919, Babe Ruth, this is great. In 1919, Babe Ruth set a single season home run record with 29 home runs in, uh, in a single year. That would still put him as like one of the best Royals hitters, uh, 29 home runs. But he does it in a single season, and he leads all of baseball doing it. In 1920, the next year, he broke his own record, almost doubling it at 54 home runs. The next year, he broke his own record again with 59 home runs. And again in 1927, a few years later, with 60 home runs in a single season. In 1927, Babe Ruth single-handedly hit one out of every seven home runs in the entire American League uh, and was the biggest superstar of the day. If you compare Babe Ruth, it's hard to compare eras in sports uh, because so much is different, but to think that one in seven home runs in the American League were one human being, that's crazy. Alex Gordon is no longer a home run hitter. He's getting old. He was one time a great hitter. Alex Gordon hasn't had a slice of pizza in 15 years. He hasn't had a can of pop, hasn't drank a Coke in over a decade. People that go into the Royals Clubhouse say that there is no more perfect specimen of a man than Alex Gordon, that he is in peak physical condition, and he's nowhere near what Babe Ruth did in 1927. Babe Ruth did it on like hot dogs and whiskey. He was in terrible shape. Uh, but was just an amazing, amazing hitter. The person in the middle is Rube Foster. Andrew Rube Foster founded the Negro, National Negro Leagues in 1920. Uh, in Kansas City, we have the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum. That Negro Leagues is the one that Rube Foster started in 1920. There, he's not the first person that invents black baseball. That had been attempted a few times, trying to make some professional leagues out of it. Uh, it's Rube Foster who makes the go at it and establishes uh, a commercial success as a league for ball players. Um, and, uh, when, you know, Kansas City, we had one of the great Negro Leagues teams, the Monarchs, uh, and Rube Foster is the one that makes that possible. The person on the right is Helen Wills. She's a tennis, do we have any tennis players in here? Any? any? Yeah? Yep. Okay, get this. Helen Wills, uh, from 1922 to 1938, so that's 16 years. In 16 years, she won 31 titles. She won it in the French Open. She won titles at Wimbledon. She won the U.S. Open. She won it in singles. She won it in doubles. And she won it in mixed doubles. There was probably no greater professional athlete, uh, certainly women athlete, but she like, ranks among the best ever uh, as a tennis player and dominated the decade of the game. Uh, and then I, I don't have a picture of this person. I think I have a, an error in my slideshow. I'm sorry. Gertrude Ederly. Gertrude Ederly was a swimmer. Uh, any swimmers in here? Okay, uh, Gertrude Hedley swam the 150-mile English Channel. It's cold. It's very cold water. Uh, she became the first woman to do so. Uh, I guess her, corner, her edge of it was 21 miles. Still, 21 miles. Dang. Uh, she did it in 14 hours and 31 minutes of constant swimming. Never got out and got into the boat. They had a boat, like, row along next to her. Um, but part of the deal was that she couldn't touch it. She would occasionally take breaks and just sort of tread water, but a uh, 14 and a half hour swim, 21 miles across. Uh, not icy water, but pretty stinking cold water. It's so at point B. In May 20th, 1927, Charles Lindbergh became the first to fly uh, solo nonstop across the Atlantic. Of course, he used an airplane, which is less impressive, but he, um, did it in uh, all the way across the ocean in an airplane titled The Spirit of St. Louis. Um, Lindbergh wasn't from St. Louis, his airplane was. He was from Minnesota and was kind of a quiet Midwesterner uh, who was always poorly cut out to become the international hero that he was. He didn't like making speeches. He didn't really like being the center of attention. I think flying solo across the Atlantic was nice because people didn't bother him for 33 and a half hours. He mostly just kind of liked to be by himself. He landed um, on an airfield in France. So like the story, he left New York, flew up the coast, um, came across the tip of Ireland where spotters began to find it, but he does this, there's no, like, 
he doesn't have a radio. He doesn't have modern navigation. He's, he's got a compass and a map, but the map is like, you're over water. Um, the fact that he did this without dying is like crazy. This is such a hard flight. Uh, they, find him in, they spot him in Southern Ireland, but, he, but he's landing in Paris. He landed in an airfield outside of Paris. And crowds were ready for him. They're like, oh my goodness, he did it. He found another continent, which is surprisingly hard. Uh, and so like, he goes and he lands in Paris, lands in the airfield, about on schedule with what, what he expected. Um, and the crowds like swarm out to greet him. And Lindbergh, Lindbergh, who's, you know, like an introvert's introvert. He does not like being the center of attention. He gets out of the plane. He sees the crowds coming to him. He's like, oh, all right, I got to do it. It's part of the deal. I'm going to be a celebrity now. And the crowds come up to him and they're like, Lindbergh, yay! And they like run right past him over to his airplane. The Spirit of St. Louis had an engine on the front of it, but was otherwise made out of like canvas stretched around a wood frame. He was flying an artwork across the Atlantic Ocean. Um, and they took out like pocket knives and started cutting souvenirs off the plane and like ripping up the sides of the Spirit of St. Louis and rolling it up under their arm and running off with it. And he's like, oh, go into my plane. I, I gotta get home, you know? I gotta, um, they had to bring out the police to go disperse the crowds. They floated it back on a boat. Spirit of St. Louis today is in the Smithsonian, but uh, poor Lindbergh. Um, Sub so point C. Silent movies had existed for years and years, but in 1927, the first major motion picture with sound was released. Uh, Al Jolson's The Jazz Singer. Jazz Singer... Um, I was talking with Mr. Grisnick about it. He and I have both seen this movie, and we agree that it's one of those movies that is great, but not actually good. Uh, you wouldn't actually enjoy watching The Jazz Singer. It's, um, it's about this musician who grows up in an Orthodox Jewish family, and he uh, um, always longs to be on stage in the star and play edgy jazz music, and he has to go and you know leave his traditional life behind, and he goes and becomes a celebrity, and a, uh, everybody loves him. But he always has this longing to go back home, and so he has to rectify his life with like traditional expectations, but the life of a star. And it's not a very good movie, uh, but it was groundbreaking because it was the first one that syncs up sound with film. Uh, and they basically printed the sound right onto the movie strip, so like the thing would play it. Uh, it's not all talking. They would actually have large sections of it with title cards that still show, but all the musical pieces you hear Al Jolson singing uh, in time with it. Although uh, Mr. Grisnick was telling me, he says most movie theaters didn't have the equipment to play sound with it, so most people actually just saw it as a silent film. Uh, but technologically groundbreaking. It's hard to recommend it. It's not that great of a movie. Um, but first talking film, The Jazz Singer, it's probably more important than great. Uh, that was in 1927. The next year, Walt Disney released Steamboat Willie. Steamboat Willie was the first animated talkie, and a lot of people saw this one. This was easier for movie theaters to show. It doesn't introduce the character of Mickey Mouse, but certainly broadens it. Uh, Walt Disney had kind of created this character. Walt, uh, the Mickey Mouse of the 20s is very different than the Mickey Mouse you know. Mickey Mouse in the 21st century is the spokesperson of the Disney Corporation. He is very polite. He eschews all kinds of conflict. If you, the Mickey Mouse Clubhouse is a terrible show. It's absolutely plotless. Every time they get into a conflict, the deus ex machina of Tootles shows up. Oh, Tootles! And like shows up and brings them a rope or something and they solve their problem. And it's awful. It's a terrible show. Mickey Mouse, I'm sorry if I've just ruined some of your childhoods here. Okay, uh, Mickey Mouse of the 1920s is... <laughs> Mickey Mouse of the 20s is edgy. He's a down-with-the-man anarchist that causes trouble uh, and basically is a rebellion against authority. This is the Mickey that you've never seen before, but I want to play a clip out of Steamboat Willie, which you might know as the lead-in of every Disney show. You know all of them are on Disney+. Plus. Yeah? 
Yeah. It's actually pretty cool. Good. So Anarchist Mickey here, Steamboat Willie. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to clue you into a couple of things. And you've seen some of this because it's... You go and watch Moana. This is the opening clip. Okay, so Walt Disney lived on Mississippi River, lived on the Missouri River. Got a river motif here. There's our star. He's a riverboat captain. His name is not Willie. I don't know. Even at the time, he was Mickey Mouse. You're right. He's the pilot. You're right. Walt Disney cartoons, especially in the early days, are curiously preoccupied with hitting people in the butt. Okay, so there's Pete. Pete's a bad guy. Pete is a cat. Cats don't like mice. Yeah. Damn the man. laughing at him for getting kicked out of the cockpit. Okay, you don't get this reference. That's chewing tobacco, which can be pressed into a brick. People might rip a corner off of it, chew it, and spit the tobacco juice. Nineteen twenties vaping here. <laughs> There's Clarabelle the cow, they're at Po Dunk Landing. This is really pretty inventive animation. There he is, first mate Mickey picking up the load. <laughs> That's not how milking works. <laughs> Mickey's resourceful. He sees a hay tra uh, trailer of hay. <laughs> oh, Minnie! <laughs> All right, you're welcome. The rest of it's on Disney Plus. If you don't have Disney Plus, go to Luke's house. You can watch it there. Okay. Um,